mean, this is my great pleasure to, to welcome Charlie, um, who I've known for many years and um, always brings a smile to my face and everybody's faces wherever he is. Um, we've judged together all over the world and we always have the greatest fun. But Charlie's actually from Uruguay, he's a sommelier, um, a film star and a wine educator, and he grew up in a pub in Montevideo. Is that right, Charlie? Your well, it, it, it was a butchy ball, it was a butchy ball club, I will say, more oh. than a pub. Oh, okay. But it was a butchy ball club full of immigrants. That's that's where I really got the one of the first to smell of wine and Demi Johns in my life when I was four oh. years old. <laughs> Uh, around about the same time when I started drinking. Um, and he, he, he trained as a sommelier and he was a, a wine waiter. His very first job was a wine waiter on the cruise line uh, uh, Cunard. Um, he's also the only Latin American ever to be awarded the prize of communicator of the year in 2012 by the International Wine and Spirit Competition. And of course he judges in many competitions including uh, Concours de Mondial and an American fine wine competition. And then Charlie's also an actor um, and he's well known for his work on uh, The Ways of Wine, um, El Camino del Vino, and then The Wine Guys, Grape Escapes in 2017. And he's done several wine documentaries, which is on the Food Network of uh, Brazil and the Discovery um, Network. He's the president of the Miami-based Grappolo Blue um, Incorporated, where he lectures conducts educational tastings, um, acts as an expert appraiser for insurance companies and consults with foreign importers and of course mentor new members of the wine community. And Charlie, we are looking forward to hearing all the fun things you have to tell us this afternoon. Very welcome to our group. My goodness, thank you to all of you for being here. Winnie, thank you. You couldn't make a better introduction even though that my wife says I'm a good actor at home. <laughs> uh, for, for, for almost 16 years. But I have to say, when I talk about Uruguay, and, and this is for you, uh, I mean, folks to understand, I, I left Uruguay actually uh, as, a, as a journalist, as a, as a broadcaster for sports. I came back about 10 years later, being a wine steward has nothing to do with my life, of course. But when I talk about uh, Tanat today, and, and, and as you mentioned about documentaries, we just finished about a year ago, a TV show called Uruguay Entre Viñas, which last night it was actually taken to, uh, it was taken to Poland and before it was in Brazil, it was in Canada, it was in Mexico, Panama, Colombia, Argentina. And, and I have to say for me, it was a great reintroduction of the wine country. But before we go to a little video that we, we have for you to see, I, I would love to mention something that, um, I like, I like always to, um, to talk because uh, before and after, I would say the history of winemaking in Uruguay and the modern wine history of Uruguay, we need to talk about um, the Latin American history and how the Virreinato uh, of uh, El Peru, I'm talking about the Peruvian kingdom that actually belonged to the Spaniards uh, already, of course, in early 1500, as you probably know that uh, Christopher Columbus was the, the person who discovered America, but not even 20 years into the colonies, the Spanish colonies, we did have actually a law uh, uh, and it was, it was implemented by the Spanish uh, and the Spaniards that they actually came to Peru because that was probably the most powerful terrain, the most, the most powerful kingdom as Mexico was for the northern part of this, the, the, the Americas. When I talk about this, I talk about uh, between 1520 to the 1600s, 1620, mostly a hundred years when actually Spain and, and Portugal, they were always dividing half of, um, Believe it or not, half of Uruguay today was almost Portuguese, more Portuguese than Spanish. When, when I talk about this, I talk about Peru, Lima, of course, the capital, and the surrounding valleys of, of what Lima is today were probably the first plantings of, of grapes. Just to give you an idea, between 1600 to 1630, 
the first producer of wine was Peru. I mean, I'm not even talking about Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay here. I'm talking about, of course, you know, wine countries at the moment that they were forced and planned to drink, of course, some of the grapes that they were coming from the old world. In the other side, uh, I would say of the Americas, when we talk about geographically, how Lusitania, of course, today is called Brazil, and Lusitania was part of the Lusitanos, the Portuguese, were also great, great wine producers, but nothing has to do, and as I like to always mention to everybody, with that Vitis vinifera that we know. I mean, this is Vitis rupestris, uh, indigenous grapes, and of course, most of them that we actually taste today and we call it criolla. Uh, in some ways today in Chile, we call Tinto País. Uh, and, 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 and when I talk about this, uh, I always go and refer myself when I put the nose in a, in a, in a glass of white wine uh, of may, maybe Torrontes in Argentina or maybe the Criolla in Uruguay that I, I love to always mention that reminds me maybe a Riesling, reminds me maybe a Moscatel. But this is very important because uh, the first, and I would say viticulturists of Latin America started in the center of, 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 uh, um, of the Americas, which was Peru. There's a lot of that happened between the 1620s, 1630s, all the way to 1850, 1870, because of course the independence of many of the South American countries from the big crown, the, the crown of Spain. Now, we have a video for you that I would like to, uh, Andrea to play, just to talk a little bit about where we're going. And of course, you know, um, this is what we're gonna be talking about, Uruguay, Tanat, and beyond. Thank you, Andrea. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you, Andrea. And, and many of you probably say, well, where is the audio of this? But 
I will I would love to say that someone just just mentioned writing. Oh, what a nostalgia! Yeah, we all have a nostalgia of Uruguay. Of course, when when uh, when we see the Atlantic Ocean, we see Cabo Polonio, which is a lighthouse there in in Maldonado, which is probably one of the most beautiful places I ever seen. Uh, maybe why I decide to live in this part of Normandy, which, by the way, I should say. I'm talking not from Uruguay, I'm in Normandy, very close to the cliffs here in Val La Rose, uh, which is a small little town, about an hour and a half away from Paris. But uh, talking about Uruguay and, and the bitter culture, I, I should actually mention something that I, I talked before about what happened in the Virreinato del Peru, in the Kingdom of Peru. Uh, something that is very capital, is very important to mention is that when the Jesuits uh, um, religion was actually kicked out of, of Peru, uh, many of you probably follow that and is connected so much with what happened also in the Northern part of the Americas with Mexico. Uh, the Franciscans actually took over many of the monasteries. And, and this is something that we, we need to always go back because actually the history repeats itself. And, and when we talk about religion, when we talk about Europe, of course, we talk about everything that happened thanks to church in Latin America, of course, happens the same way. The Franciscans. Now, when I talk about Uruguay, and as I said before, there, there's a little history about the independence from Uruguay that happened back in 1830s. And when I say back in 1830s, of course, you know, we're talking already many, many, many years after that, there's, there's a, a modern, uh, I would say, revolution. Uh, back in 1990, but when I talk about the beginning of Uruguayan viticulture, has nothing to do with what, what happened, what is happening today. And when I talk about that, um, and of course, you know, I, I have to mention that my last name is very Basque. And my family, my my grandfather, uh, great grandfather, came in 1880s when pr probably the first big immigration came to to Uruguay. Uh, not only from the Basque country, from Spain, from Italy, from Switzerland, from also Russia, some of them. And, and as I, when it was mentioning, my, uh, my beginnings were probably in a club where everybody was playing bocce, but I don't think not many people were criollos, were coming, coming from there. When I talk about that, I, I just want to say something that um, you learn. Uh, when you are a, a very young kid, of course, you know, the Italians are making great wines in your, your neighborhood. Uh, I remember in the neighborhood I grew up in Montevideo. My family is not from Montevideo, it's from the Argentinian border of Uruguay by the river, by Uruguayan River, which we're going to talk a little bit about that area. And when I talk about that, I, I remember probably the first grape I ever remember being a very young kid, it was Neviolo. Okay, Neviolo that you probably know is, is a very famous grape in Piemonte. So that tells you a little bit the type of immigration we had. And when we talk about Tanat, which of course uh, everybody knows today, and, and this is something interesting to say uh, about myself working as a wine person since 19, probably 84, I, I, I left the country calling Tanat Arriage, and I came back you know, in, in the late 90s, uh, early 2000. And of course, I, I, I went with my, with my English wife back to meet some of the winemakers. Of course, everybody was telling that, you know, we should actually call it Tanat from now on. And, and of course, and this is something interesting that happened because the institution of wine, the INAVI, was uh, in the late 80s already bringing some French winemakers to actually make sure that the name of the real grape that we were calling Arriaga because of the Basque immigrant was the real uh, actually grape and the most famous grape that we have today. Uh, not even, uh, I mean, we say Madiran all the time, but it's Irulegi or Irulegi if you speak French or is Bern or is uh, in the Adur in the Southern part of Gascoigne where, we've, where we have a lot of Tanat today. Now, of course, Tanat today, which is a flagship of Uruguay, is planted everywhere. I mean, I can tell you, you know, many, many of the, of the wine countries that they're taking Tanat as a, as a grape for blend and they're taking Tanat also, you know, as a very good rosé, by the way, because maybe, maybe, maybe related in some ways to Cabernet Franc, as you probably know, this is a grape uh, that today is part of Madiran and of course, fraternity-wise, Madiran and, and, and Uruguay uh, Tanat 
they're, they're very, I, I will say, they're very well connected when we talk about immigration. And, and I love that part of, of France as well. Now, just think about uh, into the wine country right here, into the, co the coordinates, you know, of what happened. You know, I, I can go as far as Adelaide and Auckland, New Zealand, and of course, uh, Cape Town, and then Mendoza, and then Santiago, and then Montevideo. I mean, just think about that line where the grape growing, the most important one at, 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 the, at that moment, I'm talking about 1870s, when probably we have, as mentioned before, named Arriaga actually is connected to a Basque immigrant that back in 1870, he wasn't really the one that actually uh, promote, I would say, the, the, the real winemaking. He was actually the first one who bottled and start making commerce uh, with, with the, the grape tanat. Of course, there's a lot of to say, and this is something that I, I actually, I collect, I, was, I will say from Michel Roland about 20 something years ago, sitting in Napa Valley when he learned that I was born in Uruguay, I say, Charlie, you know, the best tanat is made in the Northeast, not made in the South of Uruguay. But it's true, uh, Pascal Arriaghi actually came through Argentina came from the north of Argentina, where there's a lot of Basque colonies back then, 1870s. And he actually, instead of going south, uh, I'm talking about uh, asking maybe now, Andrea, to put a little bit of the, 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 we have a map for you right here, because we need to tell you uh, what we have. Um, and, and this is something that uh, I, love, I love to mention to you. Uh, if you actually scroll up a little bit the, the map, uh, all, maybe is me. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay. Uh, you see there Montevideo, of course, that's a very, very south, very close to the Stuari. As you, when we talk about the Stuari, the Rio de la Plata connecting to the right to the ocean, the Rio Uruguay, where you see Argentina. So somewhere between Rio Negro and Paysandú, that's the way we call it, is where the first planting of Tanat actually that, that, uh, this uh, Basque immigrant named Pascal Arriaga actually planted back then. Now, it is known today that probably the first big planting of the first big bottles, uh, bottlings of Tanat, it was made in Artigas, which is very, very, very up north to the left, right here in the Northwest. Uh, we talk about a very distinct type of Tanat, of course, you know, when we talk about the soil and then we're gonna talk about the climate and everything that happened in these five different you know, very well, we say, cut wine regions when we talk about um, Uruguay. Now, Uruguay today, um, I mentioned before about Piemonte and I mentioned before about the, the Basque country. It, it is amazing for me that I was able to actually uh, learn um, so much. Uh, and when you prepare to do, imagine seven or eight different wine, uh, wine series of uh, many of the families, Many of these families, uh, they were already in 1888, 1890, and 1895, they, they were already into wine business. Of course, much, much uh, uh, happened in between, you know, 120, 125 years from, from, from then that we actually talk about, um, you know, today, of course, Uruguay is behind Argentina, uh, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, into wine producer country, but it is it is a wine country that it has a, a, a completely different, uh, I would say, climate. Climate is 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 actually something important to mention because of the Atlantic Ocean, but also the geology. I mean, which by the way, for more for more than we talk about, uh, you know, so many wine countries, and when we talk about the climate. Uh, this is uh, a very difficult to say. And there's a, there's a winemaker that I always, uh, I actually we talk very technically about, imagine to be in a wine country uh, like these five regions where Uruguay has of course the influence of the Atlantic and the continental climate that it has almost 99 types of soil, just put it that way, from clay to limestone, to sandy soils, to red clay in the North, and, and you have, and you have uh, um, I would say schist also, which actually make, if you're in, into winemaking, make, make this country, I, I will say, so diverse in what's happening in today in the Southern part of the world. 
I, I say this because not even a year and a half ago, I taste incredible Riesling from the Atlantic Ocean uh, vineyards. I taste an amazing Pinot Noir as well that I never thought that the Atlantic Ocean was going to be able to give us you know, such a great quality. And many of you probably, if you are in America and you, you know a little bit about the Burg Burgundy wine country, the Boisset family also planted Pinot not even 25 years ago with one of the families, the pioneering families of the wine country in Uruguay named Pisano. Now, I talk about this because um, the Atlantic Ocean today actually gave us the possibility. And this is, this is something that we are learning as we speak because uh, as, as I like to say in the last three or five years, uh, there's a great that everybody's amazed uh, when we talk about uh, uh, Alvarino, of course, everybody will say, oh my, Alvarino from Galicia, what is doing down in the South? I mean, I just mentioned Riesling and then I mentioned Pino. These, these are the grapes that, of course, you know, everybody is talking today. And, and of course, we're not gonna leave behind, we're not gonna leave behind the climate change. And this is something that is helping us to probably, probably I would say, to be the country that also plants uh, a grape that everybody knows in Languedoc, that is no Marcelan. And another grape that I'm very keen of that I'd really like to uh, introduce you if you never heard, named Arina Arnoa. Arina Arnoa is a grape from the Irulegui, from the Basque country as well. Uh, and Petit Manseng, that, that, that's another grape that if you study wine, you, you need to look after because uh, as I like to say, there's nothing like having a Petit Manseng dessert wine that as we have in the region of Gascoigne or saint Um when I, when I talk about the, the geography of Uruguay, which by the way, it's 456 kilometers long and 505 kilometers wide, I would say nine hours actually driving all the way from Montevideo, you can actually make it to Rivera, which is the, 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 very, the very last bastion of, uh, of good wine making that we have in Uruguay, which by the way, personally, uh, is one of the sites that I like to always, uh, I, I'm inclined to taste those tanats because there's something to say when you go inland and you have a, a, a really subtropical uh, climate, which is that acidic, I would say tanat that you probably were actually tasting, you know, from some parts of Madiran when you actually go to the mother grape and the mother wine land, as you probably know, is in France. Now, for me, um, when I talk about Tanat, of course, the flagship of Uruguay, I like to always recommend, you know, if you actually gonna have Tanat and if you are in Uruguay, uh, try to see where these areas are from and where these wines are from, because one is, one is to taste the wines actually made close to the Atlantic Ocean, the other made to the gravel soils that you find by the uh, Southwest. And of course, down in the humidity and down in the wet, and, and when, when I talk about wet, very rainy season sometimes that we have in the southern part of, of, of Uruguay. Nothing to do with the north. And as I mentioned before, Mr. Michel Roland, he said to me, Charlie, the real tenant of Uruguay is in the north because when Pascal Arriaga planted there, he knew that the area was a little bit dry. It was a little bit hotter and they were probably the most uh, incredible lands to plant tenant. Of course, he did this almost 150 years ago, which by the way, is part of the, the, the history that um, when, we, when we mention Uruguay, we, we love to say there's so many pioneering families from back then. It was not only the Basque people, it was not only the Italian people, there were some Catalonians uh, as well that uh, they mark, uh, I will say the horizon of the Uruguayan winemaking because nothing happened I will say um, uh, remarkable uh, from uh, the 1900 all the way uh, to 1950, 1960s, where it was a big debacle because Uruguay was known of planting mostly Criolla, which is the name of the grape that we probably know in another countries like Isabella. And, and that is part, part of the grape that came with the church, right? Uh, I'm talking already back about the Franciscans that they were actually big, big viticulturists in the southern part, in the southern corn, not only in Uruguay, also in Argentina, also in the Misiones part 
as I was telling Liz and, and Andrea the other day, uh, the movie that you probably saw, and it's a very sad story, but it's a wonderful, actually remarkable story of, of the, the church in Latin America is when the Jesuits got kicked out and they were given only 24 hours. But this is something that we learned when you go to uh, the church in Uruguay that the Jesuits were, they were given 24 hours to leave the country because they were gonna get killed. And they ran all the way to Misiones to the jungles and they ended up living in Paraguay because they were afraid of course of the, the Spaniards trying to kill them. But we are actually, we talk about the Franciscan and the monasteries that we have in, in many parts of Uruguay, and, and some of them, there, they're still there, like the one in Colonia. If you go back to the map, uh, Andrea, I will actually show, Colonia is all the way to the west. Um, there's a monastery there that there's great story, all the way to the southwest of, of the country, right there where you have a little black um, on, the first, on, the, on the first actually part. If, yeah, through, right there. Perfect, thank you. There's, there's a, a, an incredible history of the last Jesuits actually living in, 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 a, in an old cave, in an old uh, chapel before they left the country to cross the river and go all the way to uh, Misiones. And then of course, all the way to what is today called Paraguay. You know, everything, as I say before, all the independent, all the independent the independency from Spain happens between 1820, 1830s, 1835. That's where the Spanish crown actually left Latin America. And of course, there's, there's great history. Even England, of course, uh, as we know, in Colonia uh, was trying, we, was actually in Bay, this part of the, 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 the country because about leather commerce that it was happening right there. And they had a big fight with the Portuguese around 1805, 1810. And one of the things that I like to say about my wine life actually came through history. Uh, yes, I love to drink wine when I was a kid in my neighborhood, but uh, I actually stick to wine because of the history and, and a history buffer because I love you know, what happened with religion and wine. And of course, I wanted to bring this to you today because for me, it's important. One, one, um, one of the things that I love, um, I love to talk about, um, uh, is is uh, the character? Um, uh, are we good with time, Andrea? Yes. Are we good with time? Yes. Yes. Uh, yep. Yeah, we've got yeah. Twenty five minutes. You've done so another. Okay. Uh, okay. Minutes. So it's is the Tanakh character, and of course, uh, you know when we talk about the, the polyphenols and uh, reverse role, uh, and this is something that uh, many many of my peeps in Umbria want to talk about uh, Sagrantino di Montefalco. The polyphenols of Tanat, the polyphenols of Tanat are almost at the same level of, of Sagrantino in, in Umbria. Uh, and, and of course, Revestorol that many people believe. This is a great, as, as I have a winemaker now in Atlantida in the southern part of, uh, of um, Uruguay that says, you know, Revestorol is good for, your, for, for, for aging. You know, you, you actually, if you, wanna, if you wanna look good, if you wanna age, if you really want to age well, Please drink a lot of tanat, which is going to help you. But what is the character, you know, of a grape that is very thick skin, that actually uh, can be, uh, as 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 I like to say, uh, resistant to to the weather, to the drought, to many many rainfalls that we have. And when I talk about rainfall, I talk about uh, you know the climate. I will actually put somewhere, you know. Um, um, I would say Galicia, the Albariño wine country in the northern part of, of the Atlantic and Bordeaux, and maybe New Zealand. And, and this is actually a nice trio and, and somewhere in between that's what the weather happens in this part, of, in this part where actually we plant. And, and of course, you know, a white grape doesn't make a, a big successful wine sometimes on the weather, but of course, when we talk about the southern part of, of, of uh, Europe, we talk about Cabernet and, uh, and Merlot, which are very suitable for that type of, 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 um, of, of soil. Now, I was talking about the character of Tanat, and of course, uh, that thick skin and deep and dry and rustic and inky red, sometimes black, and, and, and as my wife will say, this is like, like drinking ink, and of course, that plummy, a liquor character that sometimes you find that spice and, and um, I, I call it sweet spice, which uh, 
for me, it, it's, it's one of those wines that back then, uh, I say back then because when I was a young person, the, the, the wine that I was actually drinking, it was probably a very, I would say, acidic bite that I had, but that is probably the wine that I learned to drink when I was a young kid. And of course, when, when I talk about that, the today wine has nothing to do with that because we learn so much and there's so many new techniques and this is part of the wine revolution, the second wine revolution that happened back in 1990s with Inavi and every winemaker that actually was coming to, um, to visit and work in Uruguay. Uh, and there's many, many of the names that I'd like to mention later on. When I talk about Tanat, of course, uh, has nothing. Tanat from Uruguay has not much to do with a tannic big red grape. I mean, that we have in Madiran in terms of uh, character and personality. And for you as a taster, if you ever get, if you live in England, I, I have so many, so many of my friends that they actually sell there. I always like to compare, of course, uh, different grapes, different soils. And, and there is something interesting to say when when you actually taste wine from Madiran and taste wine from Uruguay. Now, your question is, uh, what happened actually with the, tan the tannin structure and what happened with the acidity? You know, of course, depends the soil, depends the region. You're talking about the Southwest, the Southeast, the South part of Uruguay. And then you have two other wine regions when we talk about Uruguay today, if you probably see the map, um, Andrea, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's there's 19 uh, we can say there's 19 departamentos departments uh Uruguay is like we cantones like like in switzerland but out of the 19 15 they produce wine now when i talk about this um i i like i like to say that um Maybe Tanati is one of those uh, full body big time reds that you really want to have if you let the wine uh, have some maturity, some bottle maturity, which I love to, I love to do. I mean, some people are talking, oh, 2020 was a great, was a great vintage. Yes, but for me, it's too young. I, I like to, to, to probably introduce you on if you have the possibility to buy some of these wines, you know, depends, uh, three, four, six years are probably great for, for aging, uh, the aging potential of, of Tanat is, is always welcome. For me, uh, this is the way I like to drink. You know, some friends would say, Charlie and, and Pandora, they like to drink wines age. Yes, I love to age. And mostly if you have to, of course, those, those days are going to age wines for 12 years, but four, six years, eight years in a nice cuvain, a nice blend wines from different parts of, of Uruguay, you can actually have an excellent wine, not for too much money. I mean, of course, there is, and they are, some expensive wines today between 40, 50, 60 euros, but average, I would say between 10, 15 pounds, you can have a wonderful uh, and a reliable uh, bottle of wine from the Uruguay one country. I mean, of course, when we talk about Tanat, uh, I, I remember my young years because I left Uruguay when, when I was 20. And I used to go in, into the parties in Donosti, in San Sebastian, and everybody was calling Bordolesa Belsa. Bordolesa Belsa is one of the, um, one of the other names of Tanat. And, and when we talk about you know, the Basque country, it's amazing that, of course, if you drink uh, in the Basque country, you drink Chacolí for white. If you drink red, you drink Eruleguí. Eru which is, uh, you know, the, the wine country in the other side of the border, where Tanat is called Bordolesa Belsa. Bordolesa Belsa means black. Bordolesa is because they always thought that Tanat was from Bordeaux, but in reality, as everybody knows, is more from the Southwest in Madiran, which is in the other side of the uh, Pyrenees. Now, uh, remember also we call Arriague, we call, we call Monstru, it's another name of the grape. But Uruguay, uh, I would say, has um, an interesting uh, array of, of, of uh, uh, red wine, uh, red grape plantings. Uh, Tanat, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Pinot Noir, Petit Verdot, Cabernet Franc, Sangiovese, Nebbiolo, Nero Davola, uh, Marcelan, as I said before, and Arid Arnoa, 
And one of the winners for me, there's something else that uh, I'd like to mention because the, the, the family is from, from um, Santa Barbara, from California, is Sinfondel. I mean, there, there is a challenge that uh, um, I actually, I belong next this year, that uh, we put in uh, Sinfondel from Uruguay with a Sinfondel from Sonoma County. And I have to tell you, there is an interesting, it's interesting structure and texture of a Zinfandel grape that, as you probably know, um, is probably the, 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 the flagship of California wine country. And, and Zinfandel in Uruguay, is, it's a must try if you never try it. Now, on the whites, uh, the white grapes, and of course, uh, we talk about Chardonnay, we talk about Sauvignon Blanc, we talk about Albariño, and, and as I mentioned, uh, Riesling Viognier, a little bit in the southwest and also in Maldonado to the southeast, close to the ocean. And, and when I talk about um, the Italian families, I have to mention uh, a friend of mine named Pablo Falabrino that also plant Arnis. As you probably know, um, the Falabrino family, which by the way, I probably, uh, you know, I was, I was drinking their wines when I was in my in my, my uh, young years with my family, uh, Falabrina was making already uh, a Nebbiolo sparkling. And that was for some people, you know, undrinkable because it was sweet, but that was what, what the bala was. You know, when I talk about Falabrina family uh, planting, of course, Nebbiolo and Sangiovese and making Ripasso, and they make wonderful dessert wines and also, uh, I mean, Arnis, Arnais, that is one of the, the wonderful grapes that we have in Piemonte. And that tells you more or less, you know, what is the, the mixing and, and, and the wonderful array of families, you know, from the Basque country. Uh, of course, we have some people from Catalonia, like the Carrao family, that they, they've been in the business uh, for, for long uh, in Uruguay. And also, of course, the Italian families, these are part of uh, the core uh, of of uh, of Uruguay that has so much to offer when you talk about diversity. Now, um, now that we are in the map, I would like to actually break down a bit because uh, Maldonado um, to the to the right here that is uh, uh, an interesting part of uh, of Uruguay today, where we see a, a, an incredible amount of wineries from Canelones uh, and Montevideo that they're moving towards the ocean because of course more, uh, and I would say investors. And, and when I talk about investors, I talk about uh, one of the most powerful ones in the world today, because I would like to say one of the most expensive wineries ever in, in the Americas. And I'm talking about all the way to British Columbia and all the way to Ontario. Uh, it's in Uruguay today that costs probably $80 million. And this is the winery called Garzon which is very close, about 10 kilometers away to the ocean where Albariño today and, and a wine named Petit Clo and Balastro are probably the most famous one. When I talk about Maldonado is the wine country uh, to go for these days because uh, these, these are um, wine lands that they're being, uh, I will say, uh, planted. And when we talk about that, we talk about 10, uh, 12 wineries right now that, uh, it's, it's amazing to say that not even 10, 15 years ago, we were having only one or two. Their, their families, they are very close to Rocha, which is actually the uh, department next to the Brazilian border on all the way is where the Atlantic Ocean is. We, we have some winemaking, of course, in the very south, which by the way, I should mention because this is interesting, uh, the Michelini, uh, actually one of uh, great winemakers of uh, Rio Negro with with um, um, with um, uh, Hans Binding. I, I will I would like to mention who's Hans who makes wines in Patagonia. Hans and, and Michelini they're making wines in this part between Maldonado and Rocha. And I have to I have to mention that I did not taste yet, but uh, everybody's point and everybody's actually is looking at that area as the the new uh, Cinderella of Uruguayan wine country now. What happened in that area, of course, you know, much more mellow wines, more aromatic wines, and of course, a much, much less tanning. And then, of course, you have to also put in perspective that we have 
the breeze and the influence of the Atlantic Ocean. There's, there's so much to say when you talk about uh, Alvarino, because Alvarino with that ocean side, ocean, ocean breeze, we can say actually has nothing to do with the Alvarino we do have. Uh, and 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 uh, in Galicia, which, by the way, as you probably know, is the motherland of Albariño. But as Pedro Ballesteros will say, a dear friend of mine at the Concours Mundial, I said, "Listen, one day we're going to do a big championship of Albariños, and which, by the way, in the right across uh, the ocean, in the other side, in Argentina." Today you find some Albariño, some Chardonnay, and Grey Sauvignon Blanc. So that tells you the revolution that these new white grapes are actually are 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 going um, to be. I would say at some point, you know, very important for a white wine country. Uh, I would say that never was because Uruguay, you know, most of the, I would say 60, 65 percent of the country does probably uh, more. Um, uh, red wine, uh, as I mentioned before, the amount of red grapes that we have, and maybe, and this is something that, of course, everybody knows, that Uruguay is per capita the country that eats more meat than any other country in the world. And when we talk about, you know, eating uh, beef, and I don't miss it. I'm not a beef uh, eater, uh, but I would have to say. Every time I go there, I send a friend of mine last year from, from England, and he said, I never have so much fun. I spend 15 days eating meat every day. He said, lucky you, because of course, uh, when you go uh, in a fun trip, and uh, many of you, you've probably been there, uh, it's wonderful to go to Montevideo, to go to a farm, and, uh, and, and to go to any part that they're gonna receive you with a nice parrillada, with a nice asado, black pudding sausage and spicy sausage and chimichurri and all that. Now, when we talk about uh, Canelones San Jose and we go to the middle of Montevideo, right here, right there, you have uh, an, an interesting array of soil. And when I talk about this, and as I mentioned before, Tanat, Merlot and Cabernet, I, there's, there's a family actually that makes an incredible wine. I have to say this because uh, it amazed me that a bottle of wine from Uruguay in the United States, uh, I, I, I lived there for almost 35 years. There's, there's a, a wine named Montevideo, which is almost the same name or the name as it was actually called by the Portuguese uh, seaman that it was coming down uh, through the coast. Montevideo is probably one of the best wines I ever taste because uh, I'm, I'm talking about that uh, wine blend of Tempranillo, Tanat, and Merlot. And when I say that, just think about, you know, how much you know about Tempranillo, which for me, as a fellow who, uh, in a way, yeah, great grandson of Spaniards that go for the first time to Spain when I'm 19 and I'm drinking Tempranillo, like every Sp Spaniard, and I like to say, my God, that blend of, of the spicy backbone Tempranillo together with Tanat, of course, for stu structure and, and texture. And then you have Merlot for that mellow, wonderful finish that you say, this wine is a world class. And the Bosa family, which by the way, not even 25 years ago, they were not even in the business of winemaking, but today they're one, one of the, actually the forces of what they've been actually been doing and showing the world that Uruguay is a wine country with a world-class uh, winemaking as well. Now, then we go to Colonia, which of course uh, is very close to the river, when I mentioned before, uh, very close to Argen Argentina. I mean, in our TV show, actually Uruguay and Trevinas, we mentioned that this is the wine country mostly for Argentinians than for Uruguayans because most of them, they come on the weekends, they have a yacht, in, not even in a half an hour, 45 minutes, you know, um, uh, crossing uh, in their own yacht, they can actually buy all the wine and buy, buy uh, probably the, the, one of the historicals, I would say, wine regions of Uruguay. Myself, my family is very close by, and my family was, uh, I, I, I was into rowing when I was a young kid. And those are the rivers that actually we train and we were very, very into, you know, rowing very young. And we learned so much about that wonderful part of the world that has 
probably a, a great amount of uh, international immigration. Back then, many Piemontese, many Swiss people that lived there, of course, cheese, and, and, and of course, many cows. And, and, and lately, we have probably the opportunity to have three or four wineries there that I like to say, there, there are interesting Viognier happening. And if you really like for elegant Tanat and elegant Cabernet Sauvignon, you have a, a wonderful uh, wineries in that area. Now, then we go in all the way north by Paysandu, Salto, and Artigas, which of course is the littoral. And as I mentioned at the beginning, that is historically where the first planting of Tanat happened. Now, this is where I will say probably the most uh, noble, I mean, the most elegant and the most wonderful, uh, you know, bottlings of Tanat might be coming from today in Uruguay. You don't see many actually exporting today because when we talk about, you know, Uruguay might be, uh, the number changes a lot, but every year, I, I do remember the last time we count, there were 1200 different wine growers all over Uruguay, but most of this area, which of course is inland and it has the influence of the subtropical uh, climate, very, very, very close to Brazil, because of course the Northern part of, of the country, I have to say there's, there's a lot of influence with Brazil and Argentina. And if you ever happen to be in the area, and I, and I really recommend you to go to the lamb uh, actually a roasting uh, weekend that most of uh, the border people actually get together in a weekend and more than 250 uh, grillers come and cook lamb and you drink wine from the borders of Brazil, Argentina and Uruguay. This is what happened between Artigas and Rivera, by the way, the, the Rivera is, a, is a, the apartment next door of Artigas, which is more into Brazil right there. There's about two, three wineries right now and the Carrao family, which uh, I, I actually, I know them for many years. They were, some of them, they were from my neighborhood where I grew up and the Carrao family today, in my opinion, and this is interesting because taking my, my, my dear wife to Uruguay around 2004, 2005, they say to me, Charlie, what kind of tanat would you, would you like to taste today? I say, well, you know, just give me something, you know, from the 70s. And of course, you know, they offered me 1979, 1975, and 1977. I think that grippy uh, uh, taste of, of, of acidity uh, and, and tannin is what I remember when I was young. And why, for some of us, being young palate, of course, and I wasn't really, yeah. Uh, was was uh, uh, something that I remember um, uh, that uh, that was a type of tanat I learned to drink. And I, I have to say, uh, filming right now, about a year and a half, two years ago, I remember uh, they put a wine from 40 years ago that I said, gosh, this is the type of wine that I would like to age and have one bottle if I can. It's like we say in Italiano, uh, vino di meditazione. So wines of meditation, because of course, if you really want to sit down and lay back with a nice glass of wine, you know, an old bottle of Tanat is what I highly recommend. I'm not a doctor, but I would like to recommend that too. So when we talk about uh, the second revolution and the second revolution of, of, wine, of wine making actually comes around 1990. When I say to you before, uh, I left the country calling the great Arriaga and I was very proud of my Basque heritage. And of course, the, 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 the things that my, my father and my grandfather, of course, the one with the beret, you know, you have to say, oh, they're all the Basque people, blah, blah, blah. That's great, it's wonderful. But of course you come back and they say, no, we don't call it anymore Arriaga. Now we call it Tana. And of course, you know, it's a new thing, I would say back then because Back in 1986, uh, uh, the, the INAVI, the Institute of, 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 of Wine of Uruguay, decided to make this a study, which actually comes along with something that it's important to say, the new actually recognition of parcels of lots of winemaking and also with te technical uh, support that they were given to these families that they were into winemaking already. That really changed a lot what happened in Europe, when you talk about, you know, what happened today with some of the vineyards, which are 30, 
to 35 years old, planted back then, you have the possibility to say Uruguay for more than I, uh, I would say that, that historically it's 150 years old. There is a big change because when I say a big change, I have to say there is there is so many flying um, uh, winemakers that you know. If I tell, I start telling you about Michel Roland, which of course he actually uh, went to Uruguay back in early uh, 1990s. Then then uh, we, we have today Paul Hobbs, which uh, you see him here in Malbec wine country and also in Argentina because Paul Hobbs is one of the number one uh, wine uh, consulting uh, fellows in, in, in America that actually also is in Uruguay. Uh, Nick Goldsmith from, from New Zealand that at some point was, uh, he came to Uruguay to work the other day he was telling me, he said, I didn't actually clinch well with the family that I was called to do. But um, one of the, the fellows that I really like to say, and of course, you know, one of the, the, the few white wines that I am always amazed to taste, and, you know, for, 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 uh, for many years, is the, the wines. And of course, when someone with the name Duncan Killiner from New Zealand that he was able to bring great Sauvignon Blancs to the Cabral family. So with flying winemakers, with new techniques uh, of viticulture, and I will say replanting and planting uh, more of the international grapes, Uruguay today appeal, you know, because of the diversity, because of the soil, because of the weather changes. And as I mentioned before, uh, there are, you know, unfortunately, many families stepping out of the business because, as I, when I say, we we talk about about twelve hundred families actually uh, working the, the the or producing or or, or, or planting uh, vineyards today, but um, maybe one hundred and eighty are the ones that they establish as a wineries. But between, I would say, 36, 38 of them. They're the ones that they export uh, to 50 different wine countries around the world. Now, put it in perspective that it, it's a small wine country between two monsters like Brazil, Argentina, and of course, we're not going to discover today what Chile is all about, which is an amazing amount of wine industry exporting already since 1960. Uruguay exports today 6.5 million of bottles a year. So. When we talk about that, we talk about uh, a country with a lot of passion, a country that, uh, of course, is very loyal to their heritage, because uh, as I mentioned, I mean, if you really understand Piemonte and the Basque country, very proud of their background. And they're, they're, the families is what, what amazes me. Very, very seldomly, you know, uh, you, you think, I mean, when you talk, of course, go to Argentina, go to Chile, but in Uruguay, there's maybe 10, 14 families that they've been around, they stick around for almost 100, 120 years, and they're, you know, the Decas, Pisano, Pisorno, Carrao, Estañari, De Luca, Bosa, uh, Brusone, Jimenez Mendez, Falabrino, Di Mayo. I'm talking about families that, if I actually you put that in scale, most of them it has an Italian heritage. And I really want to say something that I mentioned before. Filming for me into the wine country in Uruguay, in Canelones, next to Montevideo, I saw probably wine, um, wine barrels and, and wine tanks. And I'm, I'm talking about Fudre. I'm talking about the Fudre, the real one, 12,000, 16,000, 18,000 liters that I said myself, my God, this is like being in Piemonte, you know, many years ago. And indeed, most and some of those big food, uh, uh, the big tonneau, or however you want to call it, they were coming from the old world. And when I say that, Uruguay probably, it has that, that air of old world. There's a very, a very interesting young amount of winemakers, so they, tra they travel a lot. You see them in, in Europe many times. They actually travel all over the world. And they're learning, and they're actually, they have that idea of what, you know, a modern wine should taste, which of course has nothing to do with the wine from 30 years ago. Now, you probably ask me, what are the best vintages? I mean, 2020, as I mentioned before, is probably one of the best vintages for me, uh, 2018, 
2016, 2011, and 2008. Those are the vintages that I like to highly recommend. And as I mentioned before, I, you know, I like to collect wine for the longest time. And if I have a Tanat blend, I like to actually give some time for bottle aging. And when I talk about that, I mean, I'm serious because as you probably know, Tanat is one of the few, few grapes when we talk about micro ox or, or micro oxygenation uh, was actually invented maybe to smooth the grape or to smooth the smooth the, the taste of the wine. I mean, let the, let the grape be, as I, I like to say to some of my friends sometimes, because of course, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the things that uh, we are very proud today that uh, in Uruguay you have uh, US, we have uh, American investors, we have Japanese investors, we have German investors, we have uh, uh, many from Brazil and Argentina. And I'm talking about Winnie thing, for the introduction at Michelangelo last year, I introduced uh, Tanat making cement that I have to say is worth to taste, which of course is part of the new, the new ventures and the new winemaking uh, process that uh, has nothing to envy the international wine markets. And when I, when, I talk, when I talk about that, I like to say that, that, um, that dynamic of, of, of climate of, of uh, passion and, uh, and new ventures is what makes Uruguay the Cinderella of Latin America. Andre, I don't know if there's many questions. We have another video, if we are. Uh, can you run it? Uh, yes, I can do that. Yeah, hold on. We've got some people may have to leave very shortly. That's all, Charlie. Yeah. Amanda, was nice to see you, at least from here. My God, I got ages. The last time we had lunch. Thank you. Came. Sorry, I'm not on the camera. <laughs> the, the last time, the last time uh, we saw each other in Mendoza, I was filming for the sommelier. <laughs> I know, I remember. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Oh, no, this is the wrong one. Sorry. No, that's not the right one. Yeah, I saw the same track before. Yeah, exactly. Ouch. No, it's not going off. I don't know why it's not going off. Hold on. Short but sweet. <laughs> Short and sweet, yes. When I just, uh, I, I really wanted to also mention something about Montevideo, which if you actually make, make the, uh, and you go back to history, uh, um, the, um, the Americas were actually discovered back in 1492, as everybody know, but Montevideo, San Felipe Santiago de Montevideo, which is, you know, a, an incredible name for it, and very, very Catholic in a way. San Felipe Santiago de Montevideo was found in 1624. So imagine almost 124, 20, 132 years went by before, you know, the Spaniards actually uh, cemented the, 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 the capital that for many years was the rival of Buenos Aires, as, as, as many of you know. And this is something interesting to say because uh, Uruguay today, and this is for another time, I mean, I remember 20 something years ago, I got Marquesi Antinori sitting next to me in California, and I am talking about Carmen Air, Tanat, and Malbec, and I said, well, Carmen Air has something to say about how Chileans are, Malbec has something to say how Argentinians are, Antanat, they have something to say about probably the inclination of being a probably a little more Jesuit in a way. Because Uruguay, and when you go about the history and how the commerce was made out of the Atlantic Ocean, and, and this is something interesting when I talk about, I have, um, oh, thank you, the Circle Tree was organized by, I don't know who, but uh, one, one of the things that I like to say, Tanat has something to say about the um, idiosyncrasy and maybe I would say the character of the fellows from Uruguay that 
I mean, my father sometimes used to say, you know, it's very difficult to, you know, to, to get into your why and uh, to his heart. It is very, very uh, calcul calculated person in a way, but study a lot. And Tanat is kind of that type of great, that type of wine, you know. I mean, give Tanat its time, as I said. Uh, and, and one day, of course, you, you're going to find out that these wines are world class, you know. I bet there's some questions, I bet. I'm not sure there's any questions at the moment, Char. I think you've uh, covered quite a lot of ground there. At we least now you have a time to sip your wine, Charlie. Yes, I wish it was Tanaka. You never took a breath. <laughs> no, well, listen, well, remember that I, 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 as I, as I was telling Liz and Andrea the other day, I, we did almost, wow, two and a half hours for the Italian sommeliers. And we did the history of Argentina, Uruguay, and, and Chile. And I went, I, went, I went over in Italian, of course. And I have to say, it's wonderful to be in a, not in a wine country, Winnie, I'm, yeah. in a, I'm in a Kamenberg country, five kilometers away, it's full of oysters right here and a lot of salt fish. But I have, to, I, I, have to, I have to say, um, we, we're having a wonderful time. Uh, thanks to our Italian friends, our champagne makers uh, around here, some friends from the Loire, they send us some gifts sometimes, you know, Pandora's cooking and we drink some good Beaujolais, we drink some good Loire. Um, and of course, you know, for me, it's an honor, by the way, to everybody there to splash a little bit of the Uruguay that I left almost 40 years ago. Yes. Well, um, thank you. No, thank, for me. Thanks for that, Jolly. I think, I think um, you've, you've uh, answered all the questions that everybody had. Everybody is just um, dying to get back to Uruguay. So you've, uh, you've uh, made us all think that we need to book a trip there once we've got the jab in the arm so. <laughs> well there's there's a fellow from the guardian actually who writes and we were we were going to be filming together but he, for some reason he couldn't go and last year he spent 15 years 15 days over there he goes oh my god you go to the mercado del puerto which is the market in front of the in front of the the, the river and you cannot believe that you have 35 parrilladas i mean places where they grill beef and black pudding sausage and sausages and all kinds of you know all, all kinds of in, intestines that you want to taste of course because that's typical to eat there and he said i never been so happy in my life i said yeah i mean of course you know it's a place to drink good wine eat great beef uh and it's different and it, it, it is a country to learn you know uh, thank you michelle michelle says thanks charlie uh, yeah. I have to say it's a, it's a country to learn so much because also, you know, one of the things that I, 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 I omit to say, there's some, uh, I would say risque, but some, some, some adventures uh, winemakers that they like to play with Savignones. You know, uh, I, love, I love the idea of, of always mentioning, as I mentioned, I said before, you know, this is, ima imagine this, uh, Uruguay is a country that has a Bordeaux style of climate and the soil is Burgundian and then you find you have to find the grape in between. So it's a big equation. It's so difficult, you know, and thanks to the 99 types of soil that you have in the country in the five different regions that we discussed, you know, there's a way to plant different grapes. And of course, you know, it happened in Stellenbosch, it happened probably in British Columbia, or it happens maybe in Baja California, but of course over there is sand. But when I talk about Uruguay, it's amazing for me as a Uruguay and go back and find, I left Uruguay probably drinking Arriaga, as I mentioned, and drinking Neviolo when I was a kid sparkling and, and drinking some Semillon that now it disappeared uh, almost. But this is actually the idea of the pioneering family that they came, you know, back then. When I mentioned Petit Mansen, which by the way, Petit Mansen is not really a, classy or a fine grape to plant, but make such a wonderful dessert wines. And you know, when we were kids, I mean, we were kids, we were drinking sips of, you know, we, we will call it sweet wine, Moscatel, you know, but uh, thank you, Cristo, Yanu, Polikala, 
<laughs> but Charlie, we're going to have to call it a day because it's now an hour already over over the hour that we're allowed. So okay. um, it just leaves me to say thank you very, very much. And um, I'm certainly going to be trying to visit there very soon. And I see everybody else wants to go back. And I just want to tell you that one of our attendants, uh, Mark Allen, is actually sitting there drinking uh, Uruguayan wines. Oh, and, show the um, label. Show the label. What is the label? He, I'm going to show you the label. And then we have to go. <laughs> I thought I was under half an hour. I'm sorry. It seems like I <laughs> Oh, Artesana, wow, yes, Artesana, great bottle of wine. That is the people that Leslie Fellows makes in Fandel, my goodness. I well, love it's, that. A, it's, a white, it's a white blend of Gavuch, uh, Chardonnay, Moscato Bianco, and he's also drinking a 2012 Tanat. So uh, you've got love him that. rumbling in his, in his, in his cellar. So yes. thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>